Babs Kirby is an astrologer, author, lecturer and psychotherapist, the latter from which she retired in 2011 after a 30-year practice. She obtained her diploma from the Faculty of Astrological Studies in 1984. She is a founder member and fellow of the Association of Professional Astrologers International, and was also appointed to the advisory board of the National Council for Jair Cosmic Research in 2001. She is also the author of Experiential Astrology, Symbolic Journeys Using Guided Images, and the co-author of Interpreting Solar and Lunar Returns, A Psychological Approach and Love and Sexuality, an Exploration of Venus and Mars. Hello Babs, it's lovely to speak to you. Okay, how are you today? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good, I'm good thank you. Great. Perhaps you could uh, tell us a little bit about how you first started in astrology. I got interested in astrology back in the early 1970s. Yeah. And I was already involved in humanistic psychotherapy. And yeah. someone I knew did my chart for me, and that whetted my curiosity. And it was just a matter of getting to the right time and the right place in my life before I started to study it seriously. Yeah. And, and like many people, once you start studying astrology, you tend to get obsessed by it. And so, you know, once I started, I, I really went for it. Um, but having my chart done was what got me going in the first place. Yeah. So you weren't, you didn't come to astrology very early. Mm, well, nineteen seventies. Yeah. That, that's quite. A, I, I, I'm. I was in in my thirties. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, I came across it when I was twelve. Ah, <laughs> you know, right. I'd seen Linda no. Goodman's Sun Signs. Yeah. You know. <laughs> No, I didn't get into it at a very young age. I yeah. came, I came, I found humanistic psychotherapy first. Yeah. Sort of the early encounter groups and um, stalled and things like that. So I was already on that kind of a journey when I found astrology. Right. So, in addition, I mean, tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. What I'm doing now is I see clients, usually these days via Skype, although I do see some in London when I'm there, but I live in Weymouth now, so not so often face to face down here. Um, I've given several lectures in the last 12 months, yeah. and some of these involved a fair amount of biographical research into the life and work of artists. Yeah. And I've got this kind of idea that I'll publish some articles based on these lectures and possibly even a book at some point. But without a deadline, I procrastinate. Yeah. And I moved to where I live just over a year ago, so I'm still adjusting to a new rhythm of life. I write a weekly column for TV Choice. Ah. And I'm... Uh, involved in the Alexandra Eye Base project, which is a major initiative to create a global astrological digital library that would be available to all astrology, all astrologers. And it's to be a not-for-profit organization based in the States, yeah. and it should be legally in place very soon. So that's an extremely exciting, ambitious endeavour, and I'm really proud to be part of it. Yeah. And I was asked to participate because I'm a Urania Trust trustee, and the Urania Trust will be supporting this project. So the Urania Trust is an educational charity in, in England, um, and my involvement with that is very rewarding because... We're in the delightful position of making grants to various individuals and organisations who ask for our financial help. So, you know, two, two, two committees I'm involved with at the moment. Yeah, I mean, what kind of um, what kind of material can we expect in this in this proposed library? Um, they're going to digitalise. They're going to start with. Um, Things that are at, books uh, that are out of copyright, but yeah. move on to others. But things that are 
you know, valuable old documents and papers and and it's also going to be a place where astrologers could potentially bequeath their books because so often when someone dies their collection the relatives don't, the family don't know what to do with their collection necessarily yeah. so this would be somewhere that um books and papers could be left so yeah what i was sort of um getting at was are we going to see any more any, any modern works by some of the you know some of these top astrologers your old hands and... i'm sure we will yes yeah i'm sure we will yeah sounds it great will on the, the copyright issues won't it and yeah yeah it will depend on that um just going on to a, a much bigger topic i suppose what what do you see as um, as the role of astrology really in the world? Uh, I suppose I see astrology as offering a philosophical framework yeah. to those who are seeking a way to understand themselves and life better. Yeah. It's it's a pathway, it's a journey, if you like, that some undertake. Many people have an idea of what astrology is, but know very little about it. Yeah. So astrology is both controversial and extremely popular. And popular astrology sells magazines and is one of the things that many individuals know of astrology. And it seems to provoke strong feelings in some who have a scientific bent, perhaps because of its popularity. Um, ever since astronomy and astrology went their separate ways, Astrology has been ridiculed by some who think it's unscientific, but they miss the point and expect astrologers to justify their beliefs in their terms rather than seeing it as a rich symbolic language that adds meaning to our journey through life. So mm. for me, it's about meaning, um, adding uh, a greater understanding of ourselves and how we function and how we interact with other other people yeah i mean would you say it's 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 true nature the true nature of of what astrology is it's difficult to test really you can do statistics you know like the gokulin yes um experiments but for me that that was it was unsatisfactory just being able to uh, show that there's a correlation between Mars on an angle and sports people. Yeah, it's it's it, it's too it's trivial. Dry. To me, that's a bit dry, and it's, it's yeah. fine for people who want this kind of proof. And I'm quite happy for those who want that to, mm. you know, do the go through the necessary hoops, if you like, to try and get that. But you know. When you are practicing as an astrologer, it, it just works. Yeah. That's all I can say. You just have felt sense of it working. And how it works or why it works isn't really the issue. Would you have an, <laughs> would you have an answer to that question if I said, how do you think it works? Um, I would say, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and it, but it doesn't bother me that I don't know. Mm. Um, I imagine that eventually someone will work this out. But it's not going to be me. No. I'm not putting energy into trying to find out how it works. Yeah. It, 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 it's not something that um, motivates me. Yeah. I like Robert Hunt's description that uh, the birth chart is a map of the psyche. Yes. So that if you then if you accept that definition the psyche is is a living thing yeah. and a living thing is going to um bring things about yeah i mean liz green used that used this phrase i think she was talking about synchronicity but she mm. used the phrase by the things happen by the creative power of the unconscious yes and that's you know it's not difficult to make to sort of make that sort of logical progression there Mm. That, you know, no. the, it's the, uh, the the birth chart uh, is a symbolic um, picture of the psyche. Yeah, very, 
very very much so and and you know how people live their charts is mm. um something that you explore when you see a client you know you you, you you've got that map but you don't quite know how they're going to be living it and how it's going to manifest for them. Mm. Uh, so. Yeah, because not everyone's predictable. That's right. Yeah. So, given the um, given the prevalence of computer programs everywhere, I mean, how important is it, uh, do you think, to be able to use an ephemeris? Well, I think it's. I think it's essential. I think it's the astrologer's tool and a constant reference point. A computer program doesn't show the planet's motion. It doesn't show when they're slowing down or when they're about to change direction or how soon an aspect will become exact. So most astrologers calculate charts on computers these days, but knowing that someone born at noon should have their sun on the Midheaven or dawn yeah. on ascendant, things like that, is vital. So, being able to have a sense of what a chart should be like and what the motion of the planets is, is really important for an astrologer. And you won't know that if you don't work with an ephemeris. Mm. And also, when working with progressions, being able to track the planetary aspects and motion in a detailed ephemeris equally essential and being able to scan down and see when mercury goes retrograde or direct by secondary progression is also invaluable so there's loads of ways that an ephemeris is essential an essential tool for an astrologer yeah. did you use the raphael's ephemeris when you were studying yes yeah yes uh, and i still carry the current years Raphael's ephemeris around with me um, and when I was studying I used the logs, the daily movements of the planets to calculate charts and I still look at the planetary positions, I look when exactly the full and new moons occur, the ingresses of the planets into the signs, the exact time of the aspects, so you know I, I use it a lot. I think it's the only one with declination now isn't it? Well, it might be, but I don't actually use that, so... <laughs> had a long talk with... I can't, I, can't, I can't speak for that. I had a long talk with Bernadette Brady about... Um, yes. She uses she, declination, yes, fixed stars. Yeah, that would be really important to Bernadette. So she's say, you know, she was saying you get, rather than just having the horizontal, then you know you get the vertical as well. Absolutely, and, I, and, and because she's working with, with the, the sky, yeah. literally. Yeah, yeah. You know, that would really, really be important to her. Now, I know you that you, you specialise in psychological astrology, so yes. can you tell us a little bit about it, please? Well, because I was a psychotherapist first, my orientation has always been to help individuals with their psychological problems. Yeah. So I'm offering a counselling approach, and when I see a client, um, my aim is to help them understand the process that they're currently engaged in. And often a client will contact me at a time of crisis when there are major transits to their chart. So being able to talk to them about the process they're engaged in and the potential of that particular transit to help them to tolerate what may be a difficult time. And I can tell them how long it's likely to go on for. And I can see it as the universe pushing and shoving us then in the direction, if you like, we're meant to be going in. And the more we resist, the tougher a time we have. So I like to think that I can help clients and myself to cooperate with our destiny. Right. Now, is it this, um, is it especially um, geared towards young or, you know, or does it, does it look at other uh, psychologies? Yeah, not 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 specifically Jung. Um, I I did uh, an MA on uh, Jungian and post Jungian thought, and in my MA dissertation, I argued that some of Jung's concepts were derived from ancient astrological ideas um, 
but that nevertheless this concept a lot more relevant and accessible to individuals than the ancient ideas were. Um, but subsequently, Western astrology has been Jungianized by astrologers like Liz Green, who reintroduced Jungian concepts into astrological thinking. So there's an awful lot of Jung's concepts that are, astrologers are really familiar with, and um, they're very well integrated into astrological thinking. Um, yeah, sure. What, uh, for example, I mean, what do you think of Jung's four psychological types and their sort of um, yeah. relationship to the four elements? Well, precisely. Jung had an extensive knowledge of the elements from his studies. He'd read ancient texts widely, but the psychological types are nevertheless an extremely sophisticated concept compared to the early texts on the elements. So. Jung brought these into a new language and developed them far beyond anything the astrologers before him had envisaged. But equally, Jung had a system whereby um, fire and earth were opposed, shall we say, and, and air and water were opposed, whereas we astrologers don't do that and ha have a more open way of thinking about the elements. Uh, so, you know, I think Jung's psychological types is, is, is very, very rich, but I also think we shouldn't throw away all of our thinking and just embrace that in its entirety. Mm. Um... So, I mean, staying on, on topic, I mean, you know, Jung wrote about the collective unconscious too. I mean, how would, what connection would, would that have to astrology broadly? Um, well, the collective unconscious is what connects us all on an unconscious level. It's like an underground stream within the collective that we can all tap into. And Jung believed that's why all cultures have myths with similar themes which draw on collective psychological processes. And astrologers see the collective unconscious as being ruled by the outer planets, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. I know Pluto's uh, something else these days, but I still think of it as a planet. Mm. So these are all beyond the personal. Um, so individuals with one of these planets strongly placed in the chart, and by this I mean connected to a personal planet or point, will often represent the collective in some way. Um, uh, Debbie Harry, for instance, a songwriter, once said she wrote the melodies and lyrics that were already in everyone's head. So her songs are instantly recognisable. And when she does that, she's tapping into Neptune, the planet that's associated with film, music, the imagination and fantasy. So, Various people in our culture will be will embody some of these collective energies quite strongly um, yeah. for all of us. How strong is the connection, say, between the Jungian shadow, which is the sort of hidden, the dark side, as it were, and those aspects of the of the psyche that we project onto other people that that we don't like in ourselves. I mean, is is there any one? I mean, Liz Green uses Saturn as an as a sort of um, planetary. Yeah. Well, for Saturn because it describes an our, our Achilles heel where we feel most vulnerable. Yeah, it, it is very often projected. Um, but anything that we don't like about ourselves, anything we disown, we potentially put into the shadow and project onto others. So, you know, I've some people projecting Mercury or all kinds of, you know, they, you can project anything. But Saturn is a likely fellow just because, as I say, he, he, he signifies an area where we feel vulnerable. But Pluto will often get projected or you know, 
as I say, any, anything that we don't identify with and accept as part of ourselves, we're going to project, and that falls into the shadow. That, yeah, comes in, and that that also the shadow is part of what Jung called the personal unconscious, isn't it? Which is different from the collective. Yes. So, yes. can you explain that a bit for us? Um, well, it, it, it's part of it, 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 it's a it's a different level of the of consciousness, and it's more accessible than the collective unconscious. So, the collective unconscious is a level deeper and lower yeah. than that, that has less regard, if you like, for whether we manage it or not. Um, so the, the, the personal unconscious shifts and changes yeah. throughout a person's life. Um, things bubble up to the surface through our dreams. It's not, it's not as buried, it's not as inaccessible. I was just wondering also about uh, Jung's influences. I mean, do these these more modern we could say modern ideas about about the archetypes um, are they not quite similar to uh, platonic forms? Yeah, I'm, that, that, I'm not that familiar with the platonic images, so I'm not really able to answer this question. However, I would see the archetypes as the building blocks of psychic life. Yeah. And that the planets describe archetypal principles. Well, Plato thought that um, there was the that everything. I think there was you had this dualist, slightly gnostic idea about you know matter being second hand. Gnostics thought that matter was evil, and that the, and that the only thing that was real was spiritual. So yeah. Plato was saying that with that with the Platonic ideas, um, you have the ultimate. Uh, archetype. So, if we say, if we look at cats, a Plato would have said there's an archetypal cat on which all other actual real life cats are based, and yeah. they're just second hand copies. So he's he's saying the he must be logically saying that there is an order of reality which contains all these blueprints, mm. um, the, which is I, I wonder if there's you know. That has echoes of archetypes in the collective unconscious, doesn't it? Of course, it does, yes, and and we do speak very sort of readily of sort of the archetypal mother, the archetypal father, yeah. and then our real actual experience of mother and father kind of merges with that archetype, doesn't it? Mm. And you know, you find, for instance, in people who have had an absent father that there's not enough reality to impinge on that archetype, so that archetype can become very, um, you know, it, 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 it's wide open to their fantasy and their interpretation. So, so there's a meld for most of us between the archetypal and a real experience in life. Most of us have a real experience of that as well. And, um, but yes, there's yeah. without a doubt an archetypal cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you introduce us a little bit to the anima and the animus concept, and yes. how they might relate to mm. planet, uh, some of the planets in astrology? Well, I, th I think you know the anima animus is. I'm sure Jung took that from ancient astrological ideas. Um, because everyone was writing, even back then, about the contrasexual components of a man or a woman's psyche and chart, and the, the masculine planets, the sun and Mars in particular, in a woman's chart show her masculine or the kind of man she's likely to be drawn to, and the feminine planets in a man's chart show his inner feminine, if you like, his anima, or the kind of woman he's likely to be drawn to. So, yeah, I'm sure Jung was familiar with this when he developed this concept. But again, he took it to new levels 
um, who developed it. Mm. And they had their origin, I mean, our experience of the anima for, you know, in a male, it's, it starts with the mother, doesn't it? That's, um, you, that's where we yes. get our first I, first experience of women, as it were. Yes, and it would be the moon and Venus, and for, the, for a woman, the animus would be her first experience through the sun and Mars. Right. And through, as you say, through, through her father to some extent. But it, it, it's bigger than the father or the mother. Mm, yeah, sure. That, that they kind of colour it to some extent. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you, you'll, you'll find three children in a family with the same mother. Yeah. Who will all have a very different experience of that mother. Yeah. At, at yet, and she will have probably behaved differently to each of those children because of the synergy between them. And that can be seen in their charts on their moon and their Venus. That describes their experience, but it also describes what they somehow managed to draw from her. We're alluding here to projection as well, aren't we? Can, can you explain just a little bit about how projection works? Um, well, projection is, is, is what we um, see in others that we don't own as our own. Um, so aspects of ourselves that we don't identify with, that we don't own, we will see in other situations or other people and, and think it's out there, but it, 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 it's still coming towards us in some shape or form. Um, and we're having to engage with it in some shape or form because it actually belongs to us. Mm. Um, so, you know, just on a very, very, very basic level, you know, if you're feeling miserable, you might get on the bus and you might notice and think that everybody on the bus looks miserable. But actually, you may not be in touch with the fact that you're feeling miserable. Or if you're feeling happy, you just walk along the street and you seem to think everybody's smiling at you. And actually, you're radiating something that's happy and engaging. So... It, 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 it's coming towards you because you're not really grounded in it within yourself. Mm. It, I mean, we know it's um, it's it's always there in in relationships projection, yes. um, and it 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 hardly can be any other way. But it it is a very powerful thing, isn't it? Because not only do we, as it were, project um, certain. Um, expectations, as it were, mm. you know, onto a partner. If we get a, a partner who's quite responsive in that way, they can start to sort of act out, the, they respond somehow to the projection and start to sort of try and fulfil it in a way. Even oh, though yeah. even though they may not really be like that, they start to behave like the projection. Yes, absolutely. And it's quite hard to then pull back from that and say no this isn't me yeah um th th this is this isn't me and i'm not going to be i don't know maneuvered mm. into behaving in this way or acting in this way yeah but but yes but, but you know we're not as separate as we like to think mm. uh, we're a lot more merged than we, you know, we like to think of ourselves as little islands, but actually we're a lot more merged than we realise, I think. Mm. Uh, and stuff flows between people, and particularly in marriage and a close relationship. Young Yun use the uh, falling in love experience as a, as a very good example, don't they? And then when the real person later on sort of starts to emerge, they... That's the projection mm. wearing thin. Sorry, I did watch that. There was too much. There was echo. Right. Um, Jungians uh, like to use the, the the example of falling in love as as a you know for projection, and also yeah. later on when you sort of get the the, the real person starts to, to appear, as it were, um, mm -hmm. that's described as the projection diminishing. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's a huge amount of 
fantasy when people fall in love and, and it's a, almost like a mad experience but it may what it takes us to get involved <laughs> um, on, a, on a deeper level and yes as the relationship progresses gradually the reality of the person emerges and, and I suppose mm. the challenge is can we love and respect um, someone we know rather than a fantasy. Mm. I mean, Liz Green likened it to a, a, a kind of a narcissistic yes. thing because you're really falling in love with your own fantasy. Yes, absolutely. You are different. But there's usually enough of, uh, there's usually enough for us to hook those projections onto about the person. Yeah. You know, there's some reality there um but yes it is a very it, it certainly can be a very narcissistic experience but it does propel us into a relationship yeah uh, with ourselves and with another human being as well do uh, do relationship problems form a, a large part of your clientele yeah I, you know most people who come for an astrological consultation have some concerns about relationship, but you know sometimes it's about other issues as well, like direction in life, you know, fulfilment, whatever. But yeah. relationships are a major thing for everybody, I think. So finally, we come on to. Um this concept called individuation in depth psychology. Can you explain a little bit about that, what Jung meant by individuation? I, I, it, it's similar to what the humanistic therapists would call self-actualization, and it really is about um, becoming your, your, your self, and it's an ongoing process. It, it's a path. It's not something that you think you've arrived at. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's a continual journey of discovery that we're on. And that is, I mean, so individuation is this ongoing process. It's not um, a, a discovering oneself, one's limits, one's strengths. Um, and in a way, as an astrologer, I sort of see the transits and the progressions yeah. pushing us towards where and what we're meant to be, how we're meant to be going and doing things, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. you know, sure. times that can feel very difficult, it can feel like a time of tremendous loss but actually there's a kind of something new that's going to come through that's more authentic um, so it gives it gives one an, an ability to be fairly philosophical about some of the tough times in life mm. do you think the Saturn return is probably the most important little turning point or I think it's an important turning point, but not necessarily the most, you know, it's an important turning point, it's a real crunch point. Um, when you're under 30, you know, you often feel that there's a kind of feeling at 30 that you're going to meet and uh, that as you get to that age, you know, there's a real sense of having to get your act together, be out in the world, take responsibility, lots of lots of change can happen at that time. But then I think at the next Saturn return that happens at 58, that's a very, very important time of, 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 of adjustment and change as well. So I, I think there's the first 30 years, the next 30 years, the next 30 years. Is it, uh, is the one around 58, does it have the same intensity as the one at 29? I think it can, no, I don't think it has the same intensity, but I think it, 
is an important shift in values and in what's important. So whereas I think the 28, 29 to 58, and that's very much about ambition and being out in the world and making one's mark. Whereas I think when you get to 58, your values do change considerably. And yeah. um, why you're doing things changes a lot. I, th I think in a way, I know Jung talked a lot about the midlife crisis. And, and becoming more introverted and introspective. I think that happens at 58. Yeah. I think that's a really important turning point. I think the midlife crisis can be that for some people, but not necessarily. Yeah, sure. Well, we're really uh, sort of coming right to the end of this. Um, was, it, was there anything you wanted to say in closing? Anything um, at all? For me, it's been interesting to do this interview with you because it forced me to kind of gather my thoughts. Yeah. So, you know, thank you for inviting me. And, um, yeah, I'd be interested to see how it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed, in particular for making a lot of difficult concepts, you know, much more easy to understand. Well, Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks, Bab Babs Kirby. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, Jane. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.